Welcome everyone. Welcome to this online Meta Center event. I'm very excited because this is the first of Pema's um, online book tour. So today Pema is going to be releasing his book to all of us. So, um, and the book of course we're talking about is Luminous Awareness, a guidebook to natural awakening in life and in death. So this event, as I said earlier, is part of his online book tour. And for those who don't know, Pema Daldal is the Buddhist chaplain in the University of Southern Queensland's multi-faith service, the director of Jalu Buddhist Meditation Centre and the founder of the USQ Buddhist Winter School. Pema has been a Buddhist for 40 years, discovering at the age of 11 that his personal worldview and the tenets of Buddhism were in perfect accordance. So Pema has decades of experience as a Buddhist practitioner and has taught mindfulness and meditation in Buddhist educational and other settings since 2007. And of course, he is also an author. So very, very pleased to have Pema join us. We've had Pema at Meta Center before and we've always enjoyed his presence with us. So we're grateful to have him here for this event. So... Um, this event is going to be recorded and it's going to be placed online. So if you want to watch it again, you can. And um, so also, if you don't want to be part of the recording, you're welcome to also turn your video off. But we would love to see your smiling faces as well. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Pema. Thank you, Pema. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. So um, before we start, we'll just do a minute or so of silent contemplation to set our intention. So it's basically just to relax, get present and uh, be here and now. So um, we'll just take a minute to do that. And part of the Mahayana tradition and the Vajrayana tradition is to include in our wish for these kinds of activities, the benefit of all sentient beings. So we can just shift or refine or adapt our intention to include all sentient beings, the welfare of all sentient beings, that would be super. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, the teachings behind the book that I wrote, Luminous Awareness, which has a subtitle, A Guidebook to Natural Awakening in Life and in Death, something like that. Um, and it, the, that book draws on another book and a cycle of teachings that come from Tibet. So it specifically draws on um the tibetan book of the dead which is what it's known in the west which is probably not um an accurate translation of the title at all in tibetan it's known as the bado toto bado toto which translates probably more precisely as uh liberation on hearing in the intermediate states and um because the, in the West, when it was first translated, this, the Tibetan Book of the Dead has a very interesting history in the West. I did write, write an article about this, which is available for free online, and I'll put the link in uh, the chat so that after here you can have a look at it, but also so that I don't have to go over the, all of the detail about the book. Um, it has a very interesting origin story, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So, in 750 CE Kung era in Tibet, Padmasambhava, and Baba, who established Buddhism in Tibet, had uh, the desire to share these teachings about the intermediate states, the states uh, in the Bardo states. Just I'll define Bardo in a minute. However, he decided or felt or thought or perceived that those teachings were not appropriate for the Tibetan population of the time. So what he did was, but he felt that that would be very beneficial for the future. So he dictated 
the Tibetan Book of the Dead, or Bado Todo, liberation from hearing in the intermediate states, to his closest and most eminent disciple, Kandro Yeshi Sogu. She was an extraordinary being by all accounts and the first Tibetan to become enlightened, the first woman in modern history, in recorded history, to become a Buddha in her own right. So he, he dictated these teachings to her. She then hid them, <laughs> compiled them, hid them, wrote them down and hid them in a cave in central Tibet. Cave on a mountain in central Tibet, so quite, you know, inaccessible. So they hid them there and Guru Mshe prophesied or predicted or perceived that in the future, they would be rediscovered by someone who would spread these teachings around the world, not just in Tibet, but around the world. So then about 500 years later in 1341 ish, uh, a 15 year old boy by the name of Kama Lingpa, he had a dream in which Dakinis, female wisdom beings, showed him the mountain, how to get up the mountain, the cave, how to get in the cave, and where these texts were concealed in the cave. So at 15 years old, following these visions, Kamalingpa climbed the mountain, found the cave, went in the cave, retrieved the texts, brought the texts back down and um, read them. Luckily, Kamalingpa's father and mother were very um, well-established practitioners. They were gurus in their own rights, both his father and his mother. And so they had the means to share these teachings, even though he was just a 15 year old boy. So what happened then was they were copied, printed and disseminated and come and taught them after having read and practiced them himself. So then something we need to know about 1340s in both Asia and in Europe, this is the time of the Black Death. So this is the time when millions of people are dying from the bubonic plague. So the Tibetan book, the Bharatadol Liberation on Hearing in the Intermediate States, which is about death and dying, and the liberation possible in the moment of dying, it found a very receptive audience. And so it spread across the Buddhist world, particularly the world where Vajrayana Buddhism is practiced. So we're talking Tibet, Bhutan, Nepal, Sikkim, Ladakh, Mongolia, etc. So it spread like wildfire. Then in 1927, it's translated into English, renamed the Tibetan Book of the Dead because at the time, the Egyptian Book of the Dead was very popular in 1927. And they thought they'd get more sales if they called it that, which they did, it was very popular, but remains to this day, the most popular book on Tibetan Buddhism or book on Buddhism in general ever published, it remains in the top 20, every single year. So it continues to be very, very, very popular work. Anyway, in the work, it talks about bardos. Bardos is the Tibetan word. It breaks down into ba and do. Ba means together, the, individually they mean a number of things, but together it means an island in a stream, a place of stillness within movement, or a gap between one thing and another, uh, interval, a pause, a liminal, which that word we get from religious studies, liminal, which means kind of an outer or inner or in between space between one thing and another. And so although the total is often presumed to be primarily about dying, death and dying, and then rebirth, and the states that we, trans we move through as we die and then before we are reborn, it's also about all these other bardos that are in our everyday life. So there are six, generally speaking, six bardos. They include the bardo of dying, obviously. They also include the bardo of becoming, which is the process of rebirth. But they also include this life itself is a bardo. And then there's the bardo of dreaming. So, uh, but it's specifically not the dream itself. It's the, it's the space in between dreaming and waking up. So there's a bardo there, not the dream itself, but in the waking up, in between these two states of awareness, 
the dreaming state and the state of being awake. And then there's the bhara of meditation or samadhi, which is not just, you know, when you sit down in your, in your posture, it's about this nature of the mind at certain times when we're meditating, which is in between thoughts, there's this gap. As you meditate, that gap elongates. And then in that gap, there's something rather wonderful. And so the Tibetan book, the Bhara Todol, is all about that something wonderful that is in between these gaps. It's in the Bhara, right? So although traditionally we think oh, it's about death and dying and rebirth, yes, it is. But it's also about all these other in-betweens in our daily life. And it's about how all of these in-betweens are windows into our true nature, our windows into enlightenment, which is our true nature, our windows into bodhicitta, which is the awakened mind perfused by compassion. All right? So a bardo, we translate that word, it means stillness within movement or an island in a stream or a stepping stone or a place between one place and another or a between one thought and another or one moment and another. So in all of these, there is a glimpse of our true nature. There is awakening, there is enlightenment already so the other thing the sort of like quite powerful and profound theme about the notion of a bardo is that they pervade every minute of every hour of every day of our lives they're always there which means what our awakened nature is always there it's obscured by all the business in the monkey mind of the thinking feeling sensing all the bodily sensations, all our distractions, our aversions, our attachments, all of this stuff that goes on here. The effluvia. <laughs> I'm very fond of that word. It makes me laugh every time. So all of that that goes on is like uh, it's clouds covering the sun of our true nature. That's the traditional metaphor. But the sun's always shining. But the problem with us is our attention is wholly and solely on the cloud. You know, even if it's a perfectly blue sky, the sun is brilliantly shining. There's one little teeny weeny cloud. That's where our attention is, fully fixated on that cloud. And that's all we see. We just see the cloud. So the Bardo teachings or practices are about shifting our attention away from the cloud to the sun, to our true nature. And each Bardo is an opportunity, therefore, to connect with our true nature, to recognize what that is, and to abide in that and become awakened or enlightened. So, um, in Tibetan Buddhism, we have this hierarchical system that you know may or may not be um, helpful to think of as in terms of a hierarchy. But in in that hierarchy, there's this concept of the Dzogchen or Dzogchen Po. Dzogchen are considered the highest, you know, most uh, sublime teachings. You know, the point to the absolute or ultimate nature of all. Now, the Bardo teachings and Dzogchen is usually considered, you have to do a lot of prep to receive those teachings and it's for just a very few who have the capacity, right? Which is probably true. You do have to do a lot of prep. You need to have sat a lot, contemplated a lot for those teachings to actually take root and transform you. Now, the Bardo teachings, however, are actually not restricted they're actually considered preliminary or foundational or open or common, you know, not common as in they're not worth anything, but universal. We can all embrace this tradition. And all of because these practices point to these moments of natural awakening, luminous awareness in our every day, it's, it leads to the same result as these very high traditions of like Sobchen or Mahamudra, it leads to exactly the same result and actually just as fast because it, it zones in on our true nature as it manifests in our everyday life. So this is the power of these teachings. So every, every bardo is an opportunity for complete liberation. Each bardo is a natural break in the delusion of samsara. It's a completely natural pause. 
samsara is going like this, but because it's empty and impermanent, it always must die. It must stop. It always pauses until we reignite it again with our attention, our focus, what we're interested in, what we're driven by, what we're attracted to, what we're avoiding. And in each moment when it dissolves by itself naturally, awakening is there, which we could call not, there's lots of words for this, Tathagatagaba or the Buddha nature, Sugatagaba also Buddha nature. Rigpa is the word we use in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition of the Nyingma school, which means non-dual awareness. We call it luminous awareness, which is the name of my book. Um, primordial awareness. You can call it all kinds of things. Buddha nature is the most common kind of word for it. But this shines through thousands of times every day. Like literally, I'm not making this up. <laughs> Thousands of times every single day. There is an opportunity a thousand times every single day, minimum, minimum, probably more. When one thought subsides and there's a pause before another emerges, there's this moment of luminous awareness, which is the Buddha nature. You know, they, sometimes we have these moments where that pause is a little longer when we sneeze. It's like, <laughs> And then there's a two or three second pause before the mind starts up again. That's a bardo, a glimpse into awareness. But of course, when we sneeze, we're always more concerned with the bodily sensation and, oh, my, my nose is itchy. And then the noise distracts us, you know, but literally the mind stops. Or when we're startled, like someone jumps out and goes, boo. There's a moment there where the mind just stops. It's surprised <laughs> into quiet. If we are, practiced in meditation, we can then look there, turn our awareness on itself, and we can see this is our true nature here in this gap. Luminous awareness is there. There are other moments after orgasm, uh, in between when a dream ends and we start to wake, and also in meditation because we're resting, the mind quiets, and there are these moments of stillness, right? So th this is all through life. This Our true nature, Buddha nature, shines through a thousand times every day. The problem is it's only ever very fast. It's, it's a finger snap speed that it happens and we miss it because we're not looking. We're too busy with that little cloud that's there, <laughs> even though there's this vast open sky. We're far too busy with that little cloud. Looks like a puppy dog. So we stare at it for a little longer, you know? So what the Bardo practices do is they allow us to settle the mind and elongate those gaps, the Bardo's, elongate that moment. So it's no longer, it's like a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. You know, we can elongate it. Now, they talk about, the reason death is talked about a lot when we're talking about the Bardo's is because when we die, all of the things that cause the monkey mind to distract us, they fall away as the body dies. So the sense perception is the main anchor to our delusion. And as each sense falls away, the delusion is thinner and thinner and thinner, thinner and thinner and thinner, to the point where after all of the senses have fallen away, breathing has stopped, we're, according to Western science, clinically dead, but there's still a little bit of our mind that still a little bit, you know? And then the interesting thing that happens at that point is that all of this, all of these clouds that have been obscuring our view, they've gone away on their own. They're just naturally gone because what supports them is gone. The body, sensations, the thinking brain, gone. But the interesting thing is mind is not the thinking brain. Something is still there. Something very subtle is still there. And it can then go, oh, and see the true nature of mind. And as soon as that seeing is done, as soon as that recognition happens, the rest is natural. It's just you become one with that luminous awareness that has dawned in that time of dying. So this is why these practices are considered super important because there's thousands of them every day that we can take advantage of. And if we fail to do that, even if... Every single day, we're just completely obsessed with our own worldly concerns. When we die, there's still a chance that we can glimpse 
uh, true nature and, and embrace it. The traditional metaphor that's used is the child when, you know, when we're in that state of dying and that luminosity dawns, our true nature dawns, um, it's like a child climbing into its parent's lap. So it's, this is a very kind of like loving kind of thing. A lot of people in the West have problems with parents. So, you know, if that doesn't work for you, it's like, you know, literally like all delusion is gone and there's just this luminous perfection. And the idea is not that you have to do anything at that point, it's natural liberation. But if we are practiced, if we haven't meditated through our life and become aware of what this nature is, what this luminosity is, when it rises, we will just miss it. And it doesn't, if you haven't practiced meditation, it will pass very quickly. They say that the luminosity that dawns at the time of dying, which is our true nature, Buddha nature, it, it is perceived by us for as long as we're able to sit in stillness in meditation. So if we can sit in meditation for one minute, that's how long we'll be able to go, oh, here it is. You know, if we're able to sit in meditation for an hour, that's how long we'll have to make that recognition. So this is why this bardo practice, and in case you haven't noticed, meditation is a bardo practice. Why? Because there's a bardo in the act of meditation. It literally produces bardos. Meditation elongates the bardos. So it's like the core or first or primary bardo practice, right? There are these other practices that in the tantric tradition, they make a lot of poa which is like you're doing this visualization and ejecting your consciousness to another place, another pure on, something like that. These are fine if you have that kind of mind. But really, simple silent sitting, it's the hard part of practice. And there's a couple of other things that can help you along. And they are really just contemplations that you do in concert with your sitting meditation. And they're around the basics, impermanence, shunyata, which includes when we're contemplating shunyata, we also include contemplation on the illusory nature of our perception. The fact that the things that we perceive are fabrications. We're not seeing reality, this luminous perfection, as it really is. We're seeing a complete distorted delusion. We're not in direct contact with reality. We're in direct contact with our delusion. That is all. If you contemplate impermanence, you contemplate shunyata or emptiness, contemplate the illusory nature of our perception, the fabricated nature of our perception, and then also profoundly important, contemplate Buddha nature, which is not just that in our own nature, we are exactly the same as the Buddha, but that all sentient beings are in their nature the same as the Buddha. All of them, and I always, like, I'm always mean all of them, it's a bugbear of mine. Because often we think human beings are the pinnacle of biological life. This is not true. We have the ability to practice dharma, which means we can free ourselves and then free others. This is a gem. This is a jewel. This is fantastic, right? Amazing. We should be super thrilled that we have that opportunity. But birds, cats, dogs, ants, cows, pigs, sheep, eels, leeches, fleas, mosquitoes, they all are also, like us, manifestations of primordial awareness of Buddha nature. No different at all. There's that one difference. They can't free themselves. But this means not that they're not important or primary. It actually means the reverse. Because they can't help themselves. We have to look out for them. We have to help them. There's no one else to do it. So, you know, all sentient beings have Buddha nature, including ourselves. It's really, and, you know, we can't go so far with this idea that all beings are the Buddha, you know, and think that we're shit ourselves. <laughs> because that's the other side of that extreme coin, you know. All sentient beings in our nature are the Buddha. In their nature, not so you note that, it's not in their behavior. In their behavior, they might be awful. But in their nature, they're the Buddha. All of them, including ourselves. There's this interesting thing about Buddha nature. 
the contemplation of it, right? It says quite clearly in both the Mahayana tradition and the Vajrayana tradition that confidence in Buddha nature, so not one's own Buddha nature, but confidence in all beings Buddha nature in itself removes obscurations, removes obstacles, and get this, purifies all karma. So this is really super important. If we are confident in our true nature, all obscurations are removed. The description in one of the texts says, blessings will just rain down on us. You know, in Tibetan word for blessings is jinla, which trans blessings is not a great translation of that word, but it means a wave of perfection, a wave of joy that awakens our own potential. So it's not like we're getting something, it's awakening something. So these contemplations, impermanence, shunyata, which also includes the illusory nature of our own perception and Buddha nature, teamed with shamatha, these are body practices that would lead to awakening. Now there is in the early sutras, so a lot of a lot of there's a lot of uh, debate in Buddhism, of course, and in the Theravada tradition they say they don't have this notion of the bardos necessarily, but in the early sutras, the Buddha talks about seven ways that you can become enlightened, right? This is the Buddha in the early sutras, the really early ones in the Pali language that usually were recorded around 100 to 150 years after the Buddha passed away. So there, you know, a person could have been sitting with the Buddha and wrote this down, you know, so that they're considered to be reliable. In the early sutras, it clearly says there are seven ways you can come in line. One of those sevens is, guess what? In the in-between state. You know, so the Buddha himself taught this. It's not a weird Tibetan thing, but unfortunately, over time, uh, it has been lost in some traditions, but it came back in a big way in Tibetan tradition. So now, although these bhada practices are really simple and they can take advantage of these thousand or more opportunities in every single day, and even when we miss them, this is uber opportunity in, in the process of dying when all of the delusion just falls away by itself naturally. And all we need to do is be able to recognize this luminosity is the ultimate nature of all things and myself. It's the Buddha nature. If we make that recognition, the rest is natural. Liberation. Total awakening, enlightenment. And you have a choice then at that moment of awakening. You can be reborn to benefit sentient beings or you can become one with Dhammadhatu, which is the sphere or space or field of enlightenment, the disembodied state. You have a choice in that moment to become one with all or take form again and benefit sentient beings. Both options, the Buddha fully applauded. So now the Buddha said quite clearly in another sutra, which unfortunately I can't remember the name of it, but if you email me, I can give you the name of it, um, that even a murderer has the opportunity to achieve liberation at the time of death. Because why? Because nothing stains our awakened nature. Nothing. You can live your life, I think he, he used the example as a butcher or something, or and a murderer. And there was there is a whole story about this particular gangster. <laughs> or what's the word for it? Gangster. <laughs> I think it's the word. Who murdered a lot of people, robbed a lot of people. You know, even this guy was able to achieve awakening at the time of his dying because at the time of his dying he changed his mind he, he turned his mind to the dharma now often we're told karma is set karma is deterministic it takes more than just changing your mind at the time of death to change your trajectory to change your future rebirth you know it takes more than that but i'm here to tell you spoiler alert the buddha disagreed with that idea this is an idea that's very very common in buddhism karma is deterministic everything that happens to us is because of karma the buddha said quite clearly lots of stuff happens to us that's not because of karma and the examples he gave were 
physical illness might not be because of karma. Uh, violence perpetrated on you might not be because of karma. Natural disasters might not be because of karma. The Buddha never believed that everything was the result of karma. He believed that karma was one part of how our lives unfolded, how our experience unfolded. The Buddha also believed that at the time of dying, because you don't carry moment to moment all this baggage, every mind is new in each moment. Your mind is new in each moment. We think that our mind is this like thing that's been there. I'm 54. We, you know, Hammer's mind has been in existence for 54 years, going full stop that whole time. This is not true. The mind is new every 164th of a second. New one pops up. <laughs> It's renewed. It's renewed based on its habits, which means, of course, in each moment, it's exactly the same as it was before. So if you're hateful, greedy, jealous, nasty piece of work, that's what your mind will be until you change. Every single time that mind renews, that's what you'll be. That's what it will be. But if you can radically turn it around, turn the ship of karma totally around, and change those habits to love, devotion, joy. The Buddha said, despite what a lot of so-called high teachers will tell us, you can turn this around at the time of dying. Because what do you need at the time of dying? Because of that bardo, the fact that all of this falls away naturally, luminosity dawns naturally, it'll happen for everyone. It's not like, you know, Pol Pot, Stalin and Hitler won't have the same experience in the bardo. Luminosity will dawn for them too. Doesn't matter what you do, it dawns, right? All that matters is that you know what to recognize, how to recognize it when it does dawn. And this is what, what the Buddha meant by turn your mind to right view. The phrase in the sutras is if you had right view when you die, you can be liberated. What's right view? That all beings in the nature are the same as the Buddha, that everything we do has the repercussions, that our perception is fabricated, an illusion like a movie, that all things are empty, interdependent, interconnected, fluid, etc. If we shift our mind into that view as we're dying and the heart awakens with love or compassion or devotion, that the Buddha quite clearly said that's enough. So that when that dawns for you, despite the awful life you've lived, you can be free. So this is why this is like considered like a full-on opportunity that we should not miss. Because no matter how awful we are, in that moment, the playing field levels, you know, we can still be free. We can totally turn around our, the momentum of our habitual mind. It might have this momentum of greed, jealousy, hatred, anger, you know, but we can turn that momentum around. And the, But the problem is, you know, that's not that easy. You know, in the moment of dying, to suddenly try and turn it around, it's possible, you know, but it's unlikely. So that's why we need to make sure while we're living, we, we have the right view, which is what? Impermanence, shunyata, Buddha nature. Pretty much that's it. Then, live ethically, Always move towards kindness when there's a choice. Always favour others when there's a choice. Always do what is the most beneficial thing, even if it's the uneasy thing to do. Live super ethically. Turn the mind towards dharma. But the thing that's really important is that the heart's awake at that time. So you need love. You need compassion. You need devotion. Those are the rocket fuel for this experience. So, you know, you do some sitting, you do the contemplations on Buddha nature. Remember we said, you know, it's quite clear that if you have confidence in Buddha nature, obstacles actually are removed. Karma is purified, which means the habits of the mind are changed by that contemplation, by having that confidence. Then um, we do those contemplations and we do our silent sitting. But then if we really want to make sure, <laughs> if we really want to make sure we need to ignite the heart in some way. And we have two options in the Dharma. Compassion, which is the Mahayana 
whole Mahayana tradition is about awakening compassion or devotion. Now, there's a kind of ideas that devotion is a uniquely Tibetan thing, but read any of the early sutras and it's very clear that all of the students of the Buddha had, had devotion for him. The veneration with which they talk to him, the way they interact with him, it's quite clear. Devotion was a part of it at that point. So these are the things that will rocket, rocket propel your silent sitting and your contemplations. So these sort of like difficult tantric practices around the bodhis, like poa, kama mudra, which is another one where you harness sexual pleasure. These things are very complicated, difficult, and, and there are big tracks in them. They can lead to more delusion rather than less if you're not, you know, ready for them and or have not fully renounced all worldly concern, you know. But this, silent sitting, contemplating the fundamentals, compassion, devotion, it's really safe and it will get you to that point where you recognize your own nature in this life while you're alive right now, or if not that, definitely when you're dying and you'll definitely be free. No suffering rebirth. No suffering rebirth. So that's the opportunity in the bardos. No more suffering while we're alive. No miserable rebirth. So that's it. That's the opportunity that's there. So... Um, I talk about all this in length in my book. So I might... Um, Open it up to questions in a minute. I'm just thinking if I've missed something out, <laughs> which is possible. So, yeah, I think we'll open up to questions and or a conversation, if that's okay with everyone. Yes, thank you so much, Pema. That was really, really interesting. And I can see already we've got Jumpo with his hands up. So why don't we go straight to it? Uh, thank you, Tina. Um, I'm so happy uh, I made it. Uh, I had internet problems uh, uh, and it was enjoyable to, to uh, listen to your talk. Um, I have one question because um, I fully agree that uh, every sentient being has Buddha nature, true Buddha nature. Uh, also every animal, also my my uh, little Dobo woman, she has Buddha nature. <laughs> um, there are so many um, stories or legends, if it's the or fairy tales uh, in Tibetan uh, Buddhism about uh, animals, even bees, who listened to the Buddha's words and then become by listening the uh, awakening. So, uh, do, do you 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 said in your talk that um, um, they um, yeah animals they they have to be supported by us or they can't do it they they can't awaken by themselves. But um, I think they can become awakening awakening by listening to the words. As it's said there, yeah. or am I, I wrong? No, you're not wrong. I think <laughs> what's required there is a Buddha. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, we don't have a Buddha currently walking the earth in that way. So, I think what's required is a Buddha. And because the thing is, all beings are manifestations of primordial awareness. So, they're all teetering around the wedge awakening all the time, you know? So, so, and I think a Buddha knows exactly what to do to help that being awaken themselves. Because remember, the Buddha said very clearly and firmly, he could not awaken any being for them. He could only help them to awaken themselves. So we have some contradictions. And so what do we think about that? And I think what we think about that is that the Buddha as the Buddha knew exactly what to do to help the bees and the deers and the fishes to awaken themselves, knew exactly what needed to happen. So in the, in the Dharma, there's a number of 
kind of full on contradictions. And what I think we need to do is we need to test them logically. And so we have on the one hand, the Buddha saying, I can't awaken any being. They must all awaken themselves. And then on the other hand, we have these stories saying, you know, a bee awakened, a deer awakened, a fish awakened, you know, rather than go one's true, one's false, which is falling into a binary kind of dualism that is not helpful for anyone. We need to sort of open our heart to the idea that both are true and, and find a way to accept that. And my way of accepting that is that as the Buddha is the Buddha, the Buddha knew exactly what he needed to do for those beings to awaken themselves. So the other thing is, um, animals are closer to their nature, their true nature, than we are, because they're not as driven by the past and the future. They're more, I mean, they're driven by instinct and all the same sensual sense perception stuff that we are. They're trapped in the sense perception prison that we're trapped in, but they're not obsessed with the past and they're not obsessed with the future. So in a way, you know, I can see how they would be closer and that the Buddha might be able to just step in and do something to help them. So they're also, along this sort of line, there are also stories about uh, enlightened masters um, doing something very simple, usually a word or a clap of the hand or a poke in the nose or something, you know, that enables someone to recognize their nature, you know. So whatever the Buddha did was something like that, you know, it was like it, it prodded them into their own nature, you know. But the thing is about the Buddha, the Buddha, the Buddha's manifestations are limitless. So in that time, we have the Buddha teaching the Dharma, but the Buddha might have also been the bee, you know. So it's, it's, it's complicated, and I think we need to embrace the paradox and accept that both things are possibly true. Yeah, I have, I'm not sure if I've answered that. I don't know if there is an answer to these contradictions in the Dharma. I think, it's like, I think we just accept them, and we think they're both true. And that's a good practice in, you know, not taking sides, <laughs> not being too set in our ways, not being too sure about what we know, not being too um, addicted to our opinions. Okay. Yeah, both are true. Both are true, even though they're contradictory. Next. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Pema. Great question and great answer. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions, or you can also pop it into the chat as well. So Pema, while we're waiting, maybe this question. Um, so earlier you were talking about how even after someone is considered as clinically dead, that there is a part of the mind that is still left behind. Um, so in your research and your readings of the teachings, does it explain about what happens to the mind after a person dies? Like, does the mind eventually die as well, or does it continue on in the next ex existence in its form or in a different type of form? Yeah, so there's a whole chapter in the book about this. So medical death, you know, in the modern scientific world, medical death is when respiration stops, heartbeat stops, brain activity stops. So that's the definition of medical or clinical death. In Buddhism, we have a few other steps. So all of that um, respiration, heart rate, heartbeat, and brain activity are covered in what the Buddha called life functions. But then there is other parts to the process. One is heat, and one is, um, it's translated differently, but vigor. So um, so Western science covers one of the parts that the Buddha talked about, but then there's other two, heat and vigor. And um, heat means, so if you talk to a Buddhist who's received the Vibhato teachings, they will tell you that after respiration has stopped, after circulation has stopped, after heartbeat has stopped, after the brain has stopped, there's still heat at the heart centre. 
and an enlightened being, that heat will persist for days and days and days and days. In our lineage, the Dujon lineage, um, the most recent person to pass away, she was um, a young person actually, died well before her time. Kandro Simo Lanze Wangmo, a hidden yogini or master. The heart remained warm in her situation for 15 days. And so in Buddhist tradition, we keep, keep the body for that time until that heat goes away. And in that time, with a, with a master anyway, there's no bad smell, there's no putrefaction. There's, it's just the body basically looks like it's sitting in meditation and there's a little bit of heat there and just stays for as long as the master chooses to make this demonstration, right? So, and then after the heat goes, then the Buddha would talk about vigor. And that's when the body becomes inanimate, completely inanimate. So while an uh, enlightened being is in that state, what we call tukdam, where the heat is still at the heart, their body is completely pliant, you know? It's not stiff, it's not gone through rigor mortis, it's not smelly, it's not waxy, there's a rosy complexion to the cheeks. It's not, you know, the person doesn't look dead. They look like they're meditating or sleeping with profound stillness. But then when vigor leaves, then the body is completely inanimate. And then it does, you know, waxy, no longer looks alive. So this can persist many, many, many days after what we call clinical death. And in the Tibetan tradition, it's considered that some very subtle gossamer, thin part of the mind, the dualistic mind, mind you, not our true nature, um, persists, has an attachment to life and the body for up to 49 days. And the Bardo teachings teach us exactly what happens when. You know, first you lose this particular sense and you have this experience. Then you lose this sense and have this other, this is all in my book. <laughs> then you have this sense faculty goes away and you have this experience. This sense faculty goes away and you have this other experience. There's a map. And so in the book, I've got this in sort of a table. So you can, and I've bolded the bits that we need to pay attention to. So it's like, okay, this is where I am. This sense faculty has gone. I'm having this experience. You know exactly where you are. And then there are these visions that appear, which are completely fabrications of the mind. So if you're a Buddhist, you'll see Buddhas and things. If you're a Christian, you'll see angels or whatever. If you're Hindu, you see, might see Ganesh. You know, that's all completely projection of the mind. You see all these visions and stuff. So it's definitely not like this like quite elaborate process and stages that you go through which I've detailed in the book, and which the Bada Toto details to some degree. And then really all you need to know is where you are. Because what you're waiting for is for that luminosity to dawn. That's the only moment that really matters. So you need to remain calm in a state of meditation. You know how we're in meditation? All this stuff rises in the mind, knee hurts, think about the dog next door, think about, I want a donut. All this is in the mind, you know. We just, but we're just like aware of what's happening without intervening, without changing anything. We're just gently aware, calm, let everything dissolve by itself. It's the same thing in the Bardos. Whatever rises, loud noises, you lose your sight, you lose your hearing, you lose your taste, you feel cold, all goes dark. You, it's just like, okay, this is all just going on. And it's all just fabrication of the mind. And so just let it all go. And eventually you get to this point where there are these three visions, or they, I call them visions, Sometimes they, they call them appearances, usually, is the word they choose. And there's three of them, uh, white, red, and black. And in this situation, you're at the, white, at the point of the white vision or the white appearance. Respiration stopped, heartbeat has stopped, brain activity has stopped. There's very little left, but there's still a little bit of mind, dualistic mind, that can be aware of something and it becomes aware of a field of whiteness, right? This needs to be ignored because it's not the real deal. It's not the luminosity. And then if you just sit calmly and let that happen, then a red vision appears. Now, look, um, this will appear in different order. So sometimes red first, sometimes white first, depending on what your mind is most like. So if your mind is most about attachment, the red vision will appear second. So the weaker one, which is about aversion, the white vision, will appear first. So it's different for everybody. In Tibetan Buddhism, they gender this. 
So boys are supposed to do this first and girls are supposed to do that first. But as we all know, we're not all boys and girls. Many of us are not either of those. And actually these things are completely empty anyway. So it's really, for me, it's about the quality of the mind. Like is, is the mind more about attachment, more about aversion? And then whichever one that is will appear. The weaker one will appear first, the stronger one will appear second. Then there's a black vision, which is when, you know, everything's gone. You're completely disconnected from life at this point. There's still a very subtle, dual mind that knows what's going on. And that black vision happens. And that's the point in that black vision, that's when you're separated from life and your body. What's left is this sort of like very gossamer bit of mind. It's, it's barely there. And then most beings at this point panic because it's all black. They're disconnected. There's nothing here that, that they don't have, like they don't have attachment and aversion, really. They just have this very primal reaction to the darkness. And most of them just uh, freak out at that point. And then that compels them in a very negative way forward into another habitual, miserable rebirth. But those of us who've meditated and are aware of what's going on, when the black vision happens, we just go, eh, black vision, okay. <laughs> and then after the black vision, the luminosity dawns. So this luminosity is like midnight filled with light, beautiful and amazing, but very intense very intense and so also that can be a little frightening for those who haven't meditated you know because in meditation if you've got some experience there are moments when this intense luminosity happens and if you are aware of this at the time of dying you recognize oh i know what this is it's the true nature of everything and then as soon as you make that recognition you need to do nothing else the rest is natural you just become one and then there's a choice and those who have quite profound meditation experience beyond what I have, have told me that the compassionate drive just wakes up at that point. It's not connected to a person. It's just the radiance of the true nature of everything. And so this compassionate drive wakes up at that point and starts looking for a good rebirth where they can benefit beings but you can choose to become one with the mother luminosity and remain in the dharma datu or the space of awareness so there's this little you know it's a very interesting thing once you merge with luminosity there's no person left nothing's left there's just that just the luminous awareness there's only that so the sense because it's very hard to talk about this you know because we're in this sense of being I'm me and you're you and we're all separate and disconnected and you know but the reality is not that at all so it's quite hard to then talk about what's happening when you embrace luminous awareness and that separation is completely gone like the traditional metaphors there's a few traditional metaphors um you've got a jar with a lid on it there's space outside there's space inside they're separated smash it they're no longer <laughs> separated there's just one space so that's one metaphor for merging with that mother luminosity, the, the true nature of all. The other one is you've got a cast hand, there's space inside the hand, there's space outside. Open the hand. There's now just one space. So we have these metaphors to try and understand this, but I, it's actually quite beyond understanding, really, because, because we are trapped in this delusion and there's no way a lunatic can think outside their delusion there's no way so what we can do is sort of do these metaphors you know you know like it's like space inside the jar space inside the jar break the jar you know or a bubble is my preferred one because i like bubbles you know there's space inside a bubble space outside the bubble bubble pops space merges you know so it's a little hard to talk about but essentially the butter puddle and my book in particular i go through all of these steps that happen and what the landmarks are or i call them milestones so that in this journey from this existence through death to rebirth if you choose that or if you haven't practiced you have no choice it's just rebirth that is all there is you know um what happens at each point so you can go right i know what's going on i know where i am 
I know what to do at this point. And really the advice is do nothing, observe, understand that this is all just projections of the mind, no matter what shows. People who've um, had near-death experiences, you know, they've had these experiences and they've been resuscitated and they survived and I'll tell you what they've seen. You know, 99.99999% of the time, it's really tailored to how they think about themselves, what their cultural and religious beliefs are. The mind projects this. It's a projection. But ultimately, this mother luminosity, which you could give it any what word you want to, and all religions give it its own word, you know, this is what we call it in the Bardo teachings, just because we use that metaphor of the child climbing into its mother's lap as that moment of reunion, that loving, compassionate, nurturing experience, right? But you could call it anything you want. The words don't matter. It's beyond words and concepts. So, yeah, so it's a very detailed, the Bardo teachings are very detailed about what happens when you die. But my kind of thing about the Bardo's is yes we need to pay attention to this because dying is a super 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 opportunity we should not be afraid of it it is a moment of possible complete and total liberation don't fear that be prepared though don't be a nufty and just make mistakes and you know have coffee go to movies watch tv which of course i do all of those things i don't drink coffee though you know but don't be obsessed with worldly things turn your mind to dharma so that when that happens you'll be able to be free but also, there's this thousand or more opportunities every single day. Don't let those go by. Why wait till death? Do it right now, you know? So this is the whole kind of point of my book. It's like, don't wait to die. <laughs> there's no point waiting to die, though. We have that as a, you know, a parachute. It's a, it's a last option. There are these multiple thousands of opportunities every single day. Every 164th of a second, there it is. You know, make the most of that. And it's very simple. Sit in meditation, contemplate the basics, Buddha nature, impermanence, shunyata, non-self, of course, is part of that shunyata emptiness contemplation. The fact that our perception is fabricated, that what we're seeing is an illusion, a fabrication. So that when we're dying, you know, if we haven't gotten out by that point, everything in the mind throws up, we're used to this. We used to, oh, yes, this is, this is more fabrication of mind, you know, so that we know. Because a lot of times when people die, they don't know they're dead. And this is all going on and they're thinking they're having some kind of nightmare or something. They Or they think it's real. This is really happening to them. They think that they're going through this. But if, we're, if we get the habit of going illusion, illusion, fabricated, fabricated, it's all fabricated by the mind. Then in the process of dying, we kind of know this is all fabricated, you know. And if you do the practice... The taste of its illusory nature, of its empty nature, becomes palpable, you know? So you look at the world and you can taste its illusory nature. You can sense it if you've practiced enough. And then the same thing when you die. The taste of that illusory nature of it will be there and you go, ah, I have died. These are the projections of the mind. I know where I am. Rest, settle wait for that fantastic opportunity to arise i think i over answered that question <laughs> brevity no, is that was really stop. comprehensive <laughs> thank you so much pema uh, we've now got some other questions i think that that answer probably um intrigued people and also some of the questions that have come through so um <laughs> just one from um leone palpable but still not palatable. <laughs> yeah, samsara is not palatable. No. <laughs> it's not something we want to... Be. So uh, Jetsam Tenzin Palmer often talks about how we have this tendency to want to make our prisons comfy. <laughs> <laughs> Buy throw cushions, get a nice rug. <laughs> no, don't make it comfy. <laughs> it's not comfy. Don't forget what it is. So it's not palatable. Are you, do you want me to answer some um, of these questions? Yeah, so the next one um, from Robin. Pets are great attention grabbers. Is there a danger of a pet owner coming back as that pet or animal if their attention is there? Uh, okay, so there are two answers here. The answer I'm going to give, which I'll answer, do second, and the traditional answer. Now, remember I said both things can be true. 
all things can be true. So I'm not saying I don't agree with this. I'm just saying this is the traditional kind of like attitude. But as we know, the Buddha said, karma is not determinative and there's always a chance for freedom. You know, so there's always a chance for freedom. So according to some traditional takes on karma and rebirth, you can come back as an animal if your mind is what? So it's not about loving pets. <laughs> they won't bring you back as an animal. That's more likely to get you free because you have love in your heart. But to come back as an animal, the idea is that you're, you need to be unaware of emptiness, unaware of impermanence, unaware of not self, the fact that the self is a fabrication, unaware of um, Buddha nature. So the, the traditional answer about what makes a human become an animal is ignorance, which I've just framed as unawareness of these fundamental aspects of reality. So that's a traditional answer. You'll come back as an animal if you are not aware of Buddha nature, if you are not aware of emptiness, if you're not aware of impermanence, if you're not aware of the illusory nature of our perception. The there's a possibility you'll come back as an animal, right? Now, there are some other things there about like, you know, if you do this behavior, you'll come back as an elephant. If you do this, you'll come back as a dog. You know, I don't really subscribe to that stuff because it's not in the early sutras, you know? And not only is it not in the early sutras, but the Buddha made it quite clear in the early sutras, you cannot predict this. He said, he made fun. I mean, in the way that the Buddha might make fun of someone, which is warm-hearted, compassionate, jovial, he's not being mean. But he made fun of Brahmins, Hindus, who had this idea that you would come back as a donkey if you did this particular thing. He, he made fun of that. He said there's no possible way you could determine how this is going to work out, how karma mixed with environment, mixed with the quality of the mind, mixed with all time, all this stuff, how you could say, if you do this, you'll be reborn as a donkey. He really made fun of that. So, but then later, you know, after the Buddha passes away, we have all this stuff that emerges where people are going, oh, if, if you're very generous, you'll be reborn beautiful. You know, the Buddha said clearly, you can't say that, you know, and other, other stuff like, if you're really angry, you'll be born unattractive. And the Buddha said clearly, you can't say that. This is not, you, this is not something that you could confidently say. He also said, you can live your life producing tons of merit, donating to the Sangha, building temples, being a really super, super, super good person. It doesn't guarantee a good rebirth at all. He's, you know, I mean, so, so what, he's, what he was saying there was don't be good. He was saying it's unpredictable. The only thing that will make this predictable is practice. Change your mind fundamentally. All this other stuff, external stuff, donating to the Sangha, external behaviors, these are good for sure. But really, he was about the mind. If you don't change the mind, all that good stuff may come to naught. He also said, if you're a horrible person all your life and then you die, the conditions might not be there for that to ripen as a negative rebirth. Because he always talked, he used the metaphor of a field right karmic seeds are created they're thrown out in the field but every farmer knows not every single seed germinates conditions are not there for it the buddha acknowledged that you may be producing karmic seeds but they may never ripen so you know the buddha was much more diverse about karma rebirth and this stuff than we have been led to believe you know and the, the popular ideas tell us so love for a pet won't cause you to be reborn as that kind of animal the traditional answer is ignorance causes rebirth as an animal. Love, actually, for any being is a cause for liberation. So there's nothing to be afraid there. I'm a full-on cat person. <laughs> but I'm completely confident I'm not coming back as a cat. <laughs> because, I've, you know, because I've put in the time so that when I die, I will know what's going on. 
<clears throat> and I'm a crap, I'm a crap practitioner, completely crap. But when I die, I will know what's going on. You know, I know what will happen, how it will happen. And I've done enough practice in this life that when the mother luminosity dawns, I will not hopefully not miss it. So that's a long answer to that question. Should we move on to the next one? Yes, that was great though. Thank you. Next question. Once we have had a luminous moment, the mind grasps again at perception. How do we extend those moments and stop the ordinary mind grasping? Yeah, so I've, so I've, already, I've already sort of said this, but I'll say it again. Meditation. Everyone groans. I mean, honestly, people groan at the things that I say because it's like, oh, we don't want to do that. <laughs> There's no magic. There's no magic. It is meditation fueled, right, by compassion and devotion, informed, like supported by an understanding which is quite conceptual until it becomes lived, an understanding of impermanence, Buddha nature, shunyata, the illusory nature of our perception. That's, this is it. That is how, when you have a moment of luminosity or a glimpse of one's nature, that is how to make that stretch out. Until we have got this practice experience, sitting in meditation, right? The ordinary mind, dualistic mind, has the momentum to just go pop, 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 just keep going. Which is why, you know, at the, in that moment of death, <clears throat> although there is a profound opportunity that if we can turn our mind in that moment, the likelihood of that is very thin because it just the mind just pop, 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 exactly as it was before. When you sit in meditation, you can see thoughts rise seemingly out of nowhere because they have this momentum, this volition. Likewise, rebirth. The dualistic mind has this momentum, this volition, seemingly out of nowhere. And so that will just rise in the bardo and the new being will be formed around that. Like in... Um, Western science, the idea is that a body forms and the brain forms and then a mind or a person forms. We're the reverse. The dualistic mind is the kind of cornal around which a being is born, which will have the same habits as the previous being. It's not the same person. I'll go into detail about this in the book. It's a different person. I call them descendant beings. They fully are the result of our actions, our behaviour, but they're not us. They're new beings, descendant beings, for whom we are responsible, a little like children. So, you know, you don't want these descendant beings to suffer. I mean, it's nuts. So be good. <laughs> be kind. Sit in meditation. Understand these things, impermanence, Buddha nature, shunyata, the illusory nature of our perception. Understand these things. Sit in meditation. Awaken the heart through either compassion which everyone feels is much safer, or devotion, you know, either of those is fine. The problem with compassion is that it's often tied up with our sense of ourselves. I'm a good person because I'm doing this. Oh, I've done a good thing, you know. But what you can tell if compassion is real, if you've got no expectation around it, and you don't mind if the person you've been compassionate towards turns around and slaps you in the face. <laughs> You're fine, you know. You're totally fine with that. It's because you have no expectation about the outcome. You're just being compassionate. You're just being kind. And then if that person turns around, kicks and slaps you, <laughs> you're like, ah, oh, okay. It doesn't stop you from doing it again. You step away from that person so you can get slapped and kicked again. But you just don't have an expectation of the outcome, you know? And you can tell because compassion is so easily, because we come from this Christian culture that has charity and all this stuff sort of deeply embedded there in the West. And also because, you know, in other cultures like the Buddhist culture and Islamic culture and Jewish culture, there's a lot of emphasis placed on being good. So it really becomes part of how we define ourselves. So it becomes a part of the self and its clinging and its attachment. So compassion definitely will work if you can, if it can be really selfless, you know, and that takes training and time. It's not impossible. But devotion, weirdly, even though we have this fear about it, it is quite quick and happens quite naturally. 
we are already, I've said this many times before, we're already devoted to all kinds of stuff. Our jobs, money, our pets. <laughs> Football teams, cricket teams, pop stars, movie stars. We're already really devoted to these things. We just need to shift our devotion to an enlightened being, a being who can actually help us. They don't need to be alive. It can be the Buddha, Padmasambhava, Yeshi Sogyal. But that devotion is really quite fast in awakening the heart and giving this a real momentum. So that's it. There's no magic. It's hard work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> have to do the practice. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Um, I tried reading Tibetan Book of the Dead and I wondered how in the whole world would you remember all these steps and stages and is it so complex? How do we, how do you reconcile not having, for example, my son to have a chat with if I chose not to be reborn? Okay, there's, I think there's two questions there. Well, there's a statement and then there's this thing. Hmm. So... The Mahayana, okay, so I'll address the question about it complicated. Yes, yes, it is a little bit complicated. And so that's why the, my book, Luminous Awareness, is designed to be simple. So there's all these concepts and these stages and things. So I've tried to really simplify them, use tables with the sort of milestones. So you can really just go, okay, easy, easy, easy. But really the point about Bardo practice, right, is the theory is not as important as the practice. The sitting in meditation the devotion, the awakening of the heart is much more important than knowing all this theory about the elements and how the elements are tied to the senses and stuff like that. So you'll notice in my book that I've got this table that just goes, you know, which sense is tied to which element and tied to which what. Just trying to really reduce that to something very simple to just at a glance, this is what it is, you know. And you can learn that stuff if you want but you don't really need to know it. You need, and so in the tables, I've just bolded the bits that will happen to you that you will directly experience so that you know, aha, here I am, here I am, here I am. So that's it. It is really, it is complicated because life and death and rebirth are not simple things. The mind, the dualistic mind especially, is not a simple thing. It's complicated. And so this is why there's all this sort of stuff there because it's the nature of it, the mind, the body, sense perception, it's complicated. But what I've done with my book is tried to really reduce it to really something very simple. So there's that. So yes, it's complicated. And that's why you need someone to just sort of translate it for you and explain it. So number two, how do you reconcile not having presumption with something? Yeah. So as I said, you have a choice when you merge with the mother luminosity or what we call Dharmakaya, which means the Buddha body, luminous light or with Buddha nature, Tathagatagava, Sugatagava, whatever you want to call it, that absolute nature of everything that is primordially perfect, unborn, undying, ceaseless, you know, all kinds of, all the good words describe this, right? But never come close to actually describing it, you know? So you have a choice at that point because that compassionate urge will just rise by itself quite naturally and seek an appropriate rebirth where you can be of benefit to sentient beings. Because remember, you're, all, you're enlightened at this point. If you have merged with that nature, you are that nature. That nature seeks to help. It's its only, um, how do I put it, in time, it's, it's in, in time moving. It's beyond time, right? So in time moving, it's the only thing the Buddha nature wants to benefit beings. It's the only impulse. So it looks for an appropriate rebirth, an appropriate body to do the work, right? So you can just let that compassionate impulse take you and you'll be reborn. But because you're coming from not samsaric delusion, but from pure awareness, you'll be reborn in a way that will be of benefit to sentient beings. You'll have access to the teachings, the Dharma teachings. You'll have the ability to practice. You'll have that tendency from a very young age you just want to practice your practice will go really super well there'll be no obstacles and you'll be able to benefit sentient beings it'll be like you know dream life <laughs> perfect in every way in terms of a dharma practitioner you'll have everything you need to practice and you'll be totally able to help sentient beings you can make that choice if you don't wish to be reborn 
if you just want to be, if you want an end to that. And remember the Buddha, this is, the Buddha said this is a noble aspiration. They're both noble aspirations. To be free of rebirth or to choose rebirth for sentient beings. They're both noble outcomes, both totally noble. So you can choose one or the other, right? And the, I, I mean, I haven't been there. <laughs> I haven't fully properly died and fully properly gone through this. So I'm talking really from what I'm told. So what I've been taught. So in that moment, I'm not sure exactly how that decision happens, you know, but from what I've been told, the desire to be reborn in a beneficial way is very strong and compelling, very hard to resist. Like, in fact, there's no resistance. It's just, this is what the ultimate nature wants, you know? So, but you can just become one with all and, and that's a benefit as well, because that means, you know, that that's given a charge. The absolute nature of all is brighter and I suppose easier for us to recognize and see. So yeah, and then one of the things that I, I don't wanna assume that anyone has this feeling or, or feels this way, if we're attached to our past, our present life, our family, our stuff, where we live, who we are, our identity, this is a major obstacle in the Bardos because it means that the, when the mind throws up all these visions, it'll follow that strong attachment. And so it'll be very compelling and we will follow that compelling projection and be reborn exactly as we are now. Padmasambhava Padmas once said, people kept saying, oh, who was I in my last life? Who was I in my last life? And he said, if you want to know who you were in your last life, look at who you are now. <laughs> because you were exactly the same with just name change, body change, all the habits are exactly the same. You know, to say, oh, we were all Cleopatra in some past life. Yeah, no. <laughs> we're exactly like we are now. So, you know, there's some good in that. We have compassion. We have kindness. We have gentleness. We have an interest in the Dharma. So we know that was there before. It was here now, you know. But we also have, you know, a little bit of over-attachment to our partners, our pets, our sense of ourself. We have some aversions, you know. We might be afraid of snakes, afraid of spiders, afraid of, I don't know, koalas. We have, you know, a lot of negative emotions, jealousy, anger, uh, self-loathing, self-hate, the, uh, we have this. So you know that was there before. Uh, a, a lemon seed doesn't produce an apple tree that produces cherries. A cherry seed produces a cherry tree that produces cherries. You know? So if you want to know who you were in your past life, look at who you are now. And that's an exact replica with some slight changes based on causes and conditions like of the environment. You know, so you may have been, you know, Chinese, Tibetan, Malay, African in your last life. This time, you're not those things. You're something else. You may have been male in the, in the previous existence, but now you're female. You may have been female in the previous existence, but now you're non-binary. You know, you know these, these, what I would call minor things, change. But the core who you are, how you feel about yourself, the kinds of addictions and obsessions you have, kind of interests you have, the good qualities or habits you have, these are the same. You know, this is who you have been for a very, 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 very long time because you haven't intervened. We haven't intervened. We haven't made a change. We are still, you know, a cherry. <laughs> Because we were cherries before and cherries before that. And guess what? A cherry before that. So it's this momentum, this volition that we have to change. The only way to do it, sit in meditation, understand the fundamentals, awaken the heart with compassion or devotion. It's a very simple 
hard, but you know, I think check how much resistance you have to it and ask yourself, why are you resisting? <laughs> why do you not want to do this? What's the problem? You know, I mean, it's real, it's, I mean, I'm, I hope I'm not offending anyone, but it's, lun it's lunacy, sheer lunacy to miss those thousand opportunities in every day. That's, that's madness, pure delusion to instead, oh, I'm going to watch Netflix. And I've done this myself. I just finished watching Wednesday Adams. It's really fun. We all do this stuff, you know, but we should also be practicing. When we're watching, you know, whenever I watch TV or a movie or something, I remind myself fairly regularly, which is often why I lose track of what's happening in the movie. <laughs> this is just a projection, just like life, just like death, just like the Bardo states. As I watch this movie, may I recognize the fabricated nature of my own perception, you know? You can use these things we're doing to awaken to what's really going on. So we don't, it's not like we have to like be really unfun, dry and boring beings and you know miserable all the time. But you know the interesting thing is when you when you notice the illusory nature of our perception, when you 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 actually really do live, feel impermanence, when you really feel shunyata there's kind of happiness and joy it's not it's not negative it's actually quite beautiful the there is a joy in the truth there's a freedom and relief in the truth i mean we all get wrapped up i get wrapped up every day in worldly concerns <laughs> we all get wrapped up you know we all get compelled and distracted and you know we all do but the point is bring yourself back as often as you can to what's real, to what's true. Buddha nature, shunyata, impermanence. You know, that's what's real. Okay, next question. We're really running out of time, I think. We are, so one last question. But before we do, we've got a great comment, which is great to hear I can still watch TV. <laughs> so long as you do that thing. You need to just do it more than just once, which is... You know, this is a projection, as is everything. Everything is a fabrication of the mind. It's all illusory fabrication, you know. And that means that, you know, it does mean sometimes you get, you lose the track of the thing you're watching. But this as you can rewind, you know. Oh, I'm always. Oh, hang on. I've forgotten what's happening here. So you're rewinding, you know. It's completely normal. And I think, likewise, any, any emotion fabricated so if you're angry or um particularly desirous or fearful or jealous or irritated you know any feeling it's good fabrication it's a fabrication on top of a fabrication because it's based on your perception of the world and what's going on around you these emotions are mirages on top of mirages so you don't have to like suppress them block them, dislike them, you just recognize what they are. It's a fabrication. And eventually they lessen these disturbing emotions. They weaken first, then they lessen, then they disappear. So I think we may be out, really out of time. One last question, if that's okay, in the last yeah. question. Okay. Is that drop bears? <laughs> yeah, wondering. Yeah. Wondering yeah. whether blinking would be a bardo. Recall hearing that the brain shuts down and reboots in some way when we blink. Probably. So the, the mind restarts or, or emerges anew or remanifests or reappears every 1 64th of a second. So, you know, we, a blink is very quick, you know, so that's, you know, completely possible that that's actually a natural Bardo, that things shut down. But unfortunately, elongating the blink won't make, won't elongate the Bardo experience because it's no longer a blink. You're closing your eyes. <laughs> so yeah, probably. But there are other things you like, I think I said, you know, sneezing, being startled, 
after orgasm, dying, of course, um, in meditation. Um, they're, they're, there's all, they're, they're every, in between every single thought. They're everywhere. So, and the point is to take advantage of the obvious ones that, that don't have a risk. So as I said, the physical pleasure, bliss, orgasm, that can lead to more attachment to the body, more attachment to the world, more attachment to your sense of yourself because our sense of pleasure, physical experience is very tied in with who we are, who we think we are. So that one, although if you're completely renounced, you know, if you're a complete renunciate, that one works, you know, because you're, you're, you're not concerned about the pleasure. You're just looking for the break, the pause after the pleasure subsides, right? Also, um, when you're really, really hot, you know, and you get to that point, you're like, I can't bear this heat anymore. There's a bar over there because the mind just starts to shut down. Likewise, when you're really cold, the mind just starts to shut down, you know, and there's a bar over there. But you don't want to put yourself in these extreme situations, you know. Also, fainting is a bar in fainting, you know, but you don't want to provoke fainting, extreme heat, <laughs> extreme cold. You, know, you don't want to provoke those. The, the ones that are easy and safe are in between dreaming and waking, in between each thought, which we access through meditation, and um, the one that comes after awe or through awe or with awe. And that awe can be for nature or for a teacher, devotion, or in that way. So awe is a good one. So it's not wise to, you know, chase after fainting or <laughs> blinking. Can you imagine chasing after blinking? I'm doing, I'm doing my practice. Uh, you know, you don't want to chase those things, but you do want to chase or you can cultivate or in nature, in devotion to your teacher. You know, love is another one, like really profound, selfless, full-on love. It triggers a bardo because the mind just settles right down. Joy is another one. In fact, all of the, the four immeasurables are all ways to awaken to this. So love, compassion, joy, equanimity, total evenness, which is, you know, in this sense, total contentment. If you're totally content, you're not thinking about the past, you're not thinking about the future, you're not wanting this situation to be any different. So the mind just really settles down and the true nature shines, you know. So the, so the Bada teachings are about chasing the safe the safe ones, you know, the ones that can be replicated easily at any place and there's no trap in them. They're not going to get you hooked to something weird like, you know, fainting or, you know, extreme experiences or like um, also being frightened, like being, Boo! that is one. And sometimes teachers do do that, which I find irritating. My teachers have done that to me. Uh, but it's one, you know, but you don't really want to go around trying to scare people. <laughs> Because you don't know how that's going to end, really. You push them right into the bar of dying. You know, it's not a good idea. So we cultivate the safe ones. And blinking may well be one, but it's one that we can't really capitalise on, you know. So we look to the ones that are useful, beneficial, easy and safe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pema. I think that comes to the end of our questions and the session as well. Um, Pema, that was such a lovely session. And also, um, this is such a worthy cause and the writings that you have now offered to the world as well. Um, can I invite you to end the session today with a dedication of merits? Yes, I will do that. Well, also, just before we go, um, we're doing a little fundraiser for a non-sectarian retreat centre. So if you buy copies of the book from this link that I'm putting in the chat now, they'll be signed by me, which is not necessarily a selling point. But a selling point might be that the money will go to a non-sectarian retreat centre where people can actually do practice. Um, so if you want to go there, get that. Oh, thanks, Amy. So I will do the dedication that I normally do. You can all do the dedication you all normally do. I do something that's quite simple that comes from my lineage. Um, but the main thing about, you know, when we set our intention at the beginning and we remain, you know, kind of like mindful of what we're doing throughout and then we dedicate at the end, it's, it's got some functions. Function number one, it keeps us 
um, tethered to an altruistic intention, which is really important. The heart can't awaken if we're just doing this for ourselves. Number two, it's a recognition of the interconnected nature of all things and all beings. So when we, you know, we dedicate, it's an acknowledgement that there is actually no separation between us and others. When we dedicate the positive value to the mind of what we have done actually can be accessed by others. So that's why we do this dedication. Mine's pretty brief, but you can do whatever you like. By this effort, may all be may all beings be free of oh, actually I'll do a really beach one. That was a bit I was started to do my long one. Actually, I don't know what to do. I'll put it in the chat. It's a brief one. Okay. So I'm just going to try and okay. I'll just do the really super brief one. Copy and pasting at this point is too tricky. <laughs> By this effort, may all beings abide in the bliss and equanimity of their true nature. Om Mahu. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Tina and Meta Center, which I, on the record, think they're doing wonderful work. So many amazing things happen at the Meta Center. It's really, really great. I think it's. I think you're the only truly non-sectarian Dharma Center in Australia. I think it's really wonderful. I think it's really great what you're doing. Thank you, Tina. And oh, thank you so much, Pema. Thanks for the endorsement. Um, <laughs> and also, no, for you. the record, we're not the only one. There's, out, there's others out there, yeah. well, <laughs> which is wonderful to know as well. But thank you. And um, it's with the support of people like you, Pema, offering your teachings, sharing with us that we can share with other people different traditions and the teachings as well. But thank you to all those who have participated today and attended. Thank you for your questions, which was really, really useful. And also, really, the discussion was great tonight. So um, I hope all goes well, Pema, for the rest of your book tour. And, thank you. Um, yeah, and probably see you soon, maybe online, yeah. or maybe in person. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Matt Center. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.